so that that's so brilliantly framed. And I think, you know, this is that all put together, that's really it pierces the argument. If the argument was ever meant to be taken seriously in the first place, I feel like a lot of this is a um is a holding pattern. You know, it's just it's just kind of creating distraction while the you know the powerful people in this country extract as many resources as possible before they set all of it on fire. But to the extent we're having a serious conversation, I think, you know, you you just kind of captured it perfectly. On the one hand, it is not only illogical, but silly to say that there that history is not important because history is literally everything that happened just before this moment in time. So you're not having an adult conversation with us. You're you're taking an idea, using a kind of cartoon version of it and saying at some random interval that I, white man with some kind of position of authority will determine from this point backwards, that stuff won't matter. I promise you, if I, if I smash that man's windshield while he's having that interview and he walks outside and it's smashed, if I say to him, it's cool, it's the end of history. So that, it doesn't matter I smashed your windshield, it's all <laughs> the present tense. He's gonna call the police on me because history is relative to his interpretation of it. History matters if that dude has tenure. I do not know if he does or doesn't, but let's say whatever little community college he runs his mouth at for money has given him tenure. And you say, uh, sorry, dude, we, we thought maybe social justice should be taught by people who know something about social justice based on their own experience, he won't want to hear your tenure doesn't matter anymore. He'll be like, I got tenure five years ago. So history does matter to everybody very much. That, so that argument is just, just silly, but it's exactly, I think, uh, as, as you're explaining it, Sam, it's like the t it's the wrong target. I think it's the wrong target on purpose. I think it's, it's intended to be a distraction. And I, I believe the, um, I think the thesis is strong that you're like, this is about the white people. They don't know what to do when the black people are radicalized. So they're just not gonna worry about that right now because really all they need is for elections to keep going the way they're going long enough for there to be nothing left of the American And whatever happens after that is not their interest or problem. They don't, you know, they're not thinking any further ahead than that. They'll be very happy to turn over the whole country to black folks once they've destroyed it, once it's a, literally the entire country's burning instead of 20 or 25% of it, which is basically what's happening now, then they'll be like, you're right. We believe in justice as well. Take this steaming pile of dog shit and we're equal. We're all fair and square. We're gonna be in the Caribbean. We're gonna extract some more resources from someone else. You look at the pattern, and that's what it is. What's offensive about this kind of stuff is they present it as if they care about social justice, as if they care about people. The conversation we need to have is, you know, why doesn't the left recognize its own sociopathology? Why do white people who think that they are progressive and left-leaning, like not recognize that they have, they are not capable of the emotional imagination that's required to be just a basic human being? And if you can't do that, if I can't, you know, if I can't see somebody stub their toe and some part of my brain says, ah, oh, that hurts when that happens, when I stub my toe, I can imagine what that's like. If you've lost that ability, if you're always kind of jostling people when you're walking down the street and you're all, even your little stuff indicates if your kids are like robots, if you have no relationship with, with any of your family members, you, should, you need to work on that stuff and stop acting like you have a theory of the world that's going to help anybody else. And I think that's a I think that's really where these people need to be. They don't need to be on YouTube. They need to be in therapy and they need to be stop talking like they know anything when they can very comfortably sit back and say all of the pain that other people have suffered is really unimportant. And they are all nodding at each other and say, oh, very deep, very interesting. It's a lot of bull. They're crazy. They need a re-education camp and they better be careful because they're going to get it. What's going to happen is, Sam, like you're saying, what happens when you radicalize the black folks, it doesn't, you don't need to be in the majority to be in power. And 18, 19% of a population is plenty to take over. 
What are you going to do? All you need is 3% for a revolution. There's that's articles, all you need. Papers have been written, 3%. And if on Dr. top of Vera, that, I'm sure he'd agree with you. And on top of that, another way for us to be radical is y'all can't win a revolution without Negroes. All Negroes got to do is sit, stay home and serve the new master. Because both right now, the left is racist and the right is racist. So at the end of the day, they both hate right. us. So why do we care which new master we serve? We've been doing that shit I've, in this country for hundreds of years. Fuck them. I've never heard the kind of focused conversation on, on black folks as I'm hearing now in terms of like, why not conservatism? You know, why, why not just go with the Republicans for a generation and see what happens? It's never been, it's always been there. And there's always been conservative black folks, of course. But we're talking about electoral politics and I think, you know, more than ever, I think there's folks that are like, why wouldn't we? What's the argument so, against? So, so I'm not yeah. there yet, but I see a lot of people leaning right. I think 2024, y'all think- better watch out for the blacks. Like people were people were having a fit when they lied and said, hold on, let me turn on my camera. People were oh. having a fit when they lied and said that black people went, that black people went 10% per Trump. We were still under under the double digits, and that includes non-Black Americans since the chattel slavery. A lot of foreign Blacks are Republicans. What they gonna do when the sentence of chattel slavery go right? And that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that's the answer because they're racist too, but both right. sides are fucking up and neither side is serving us. And a lot of people just want to see this shit burn down. I don't want to see it burn down. I would like to see a good world for everybody else and my children. Like, I would. Like, I would like to see the people I care about make it through the Hunger Game. I would like for there not to be a Hunger Game. But this shit right here, the way this shit's going, like, like lower income white people, poor white people, these middle class and upper class whites are leading you to your destruction. That's, that's a good way. I just use my words carefully. Ooh, let's get back to the video because we ain't got through five minutes. Let's let's go. Let's get back to the video. We'll come back around because they keep saying shit. So, whew. all right, all right, let's go. I'll... You know the things you're talking about with terrain and the and the, uh, and the New Deal. Totally, it's could be useful to have people stop saying things which are false, especially if those things that they're saying that are false are helping them make their points. So, even I, as anti-historicist as I've become. <laughs> You know, I'm not, I mean, I am going around saying, you know, Marx should have said, it wasn't enough to say, you know, if the philosophers have only understood the world, the point of What is false that black people, that people are saying about the New Deal? The New Deal was racist. It was set up to carve out black people. Yes, some poor we, whites got fucked up in the process, but like my white lady friend, Edie, who y'all have heard on here, come on the show plenty of times, explained to me, her family member who got excluded because of farm work went and was able to get a white job with the New Deal program and still get the benefits. So those white farmers were able to move into other programs. They didn't have to stay farmers. They could quit being farmers and go do something else in the New Deal and get those fucking benefits. Black people couldn't do that shit. So quit fucking playing us. <sighs> I mean, yeah, that's that's the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> they want to act like... Uh just because people don't sit there and give like very new nuanced details in describing how uh, we were locked out. That means that we weren't exactly locked out because the government didn't specifically say black people can't get these benefits. And it's bullshit because they know like when a program is set up uh, to disproportionately uh, uh, hurt us, it's, they, they, they understand that concept. Um, because they make the same argument, but in the inverse, when they talk about the universal programs disproportionately benefiting us. That's right. So, like, this is just bullshit. Facts. Like, facts. Uh, uh, anybody else before we get back? I know I stopped to kind of soon, but I just get so tired of that. And, like, what's frustrating for me is, like, my friend Edie is a big New Dealer. She completely believes in the New Deal. And all she says is, you know, Sam, I would like the New Deal without the racism. Why can't y'all just say that? Right. Just just admit it. I mean, there's documentation where where Southern congressmen were like, 
you know, I'm not follow. I'm not agreeing to this until you prevent these jobs that overwhelmingly are done by black folks to to be separated out from the New Deal. Like they were like, we're cool with it if you make sure black folks don't benefit. From it. it seems to me, uh, concessions to or dealings with the Congress, the legislature, which was dominated by racist. Democrats from the South. Now, on the eve of the inauguration, the month before, in February 1933, Walter Lippmann, the most important uh, columnist in the country, wrote seven columns in the Herald Tribune in which he counseled President Roosevelt that it would be necessary to suspend Congress if the emergency of the collapse of the economy were to be addressed. And the last few paragraphs of the great inaugural speech, the one in which uh, the president told us we had nothing to fear but fear itself, um, the end of that speech, uh, the president said, I will ask the Congress to do A, B, and C, and if they do not, I will ask for the one remaining uh, capacity that I will need, the right to rule by executive power. But he never did that. The country never had that happen executive capacity grew, but it did not bypass Congress. Even the 100 days, uh, the great legislative torrent that set the country on a new path uh, in the first period of the Roosevelt presidency, occurred in the Congress, and the Congress uh, often inserted items in that legislation the president himself did not want. We never lost that centrality of the legislature. but ironies on top of ironies uh, involved in the story. As you note, the Democratic Party was a strange uh, bedfellows uh, institution. Uh, Northern liberals like Robert Wagner of New York, uh, Southern racists like Theodore Bilbo of Mississippi. And after 1938, a majority of Democrats in Congress were from the 17 states in the Union that practiced mandatory racial segregation. So one of the questions I placed front and center in the book was, well, what difference did that make? Um, we kept legislative uh, government. Um, we kept lawmaking. We kept democracy. But we did so in a Faustian bargain, a Faustian bargain that linked modern American democracy and its remaking to the least liberal, least democratic part of the American polity. Because of legislation, legislature shall I call it supremacy, or because in your own thinking, we happily enough did not find Franklin Roosevelt executing or calling upon those final supreme presidential powers. Ah, it's, a, it's such a complex matter um, and fascinating. Lawmaking occurs through a complex process in the legislature. The masters of that process were Southern Democrats. Why? They came from a one-party system. They didn't have opposition. They had great seniority. They had mass ex massive experience. They often occupied the central leadership posts. Uh, the president, in going to Congress, in submitting legislation to Congress, in not doing what Lippmann had proposed, suspending Congress, had no choice but to work within the legislature in a manner as dictated by the leaders of congressional committees, the Speaker of the House, the majority leader, and the full complement of Southerners in the House and the Senate who truly dominated the institution. And in consequence, nothing could pass into law against their opposition in the 1930s and 1940s. And after 38, when they constituted a majority of the party, I go so far as to claim that everything that passed into law mapped almost precisely onto the preferences of the American South. But these white Southern representatives were not conservatives in the sense of today's conservatives. They came from a dirt poor region. They liked the New Deal. Bilbo, the leading racist in the Senate, campaigned as a 100% New Dealer, but all that depended on keeping race off the national agenda and of making sure that the South maintained its autonomy in matters of race. You make certain that the reader knows 
that FDR was aware of this. Yes. And that FDR was aware of the, what you call the Faustian bargain. And that even in the matter of an anti-lynching bill, he would not speak up for it that's because of what that would have done to his support in the South. I think that's quite correct. Um, President Roosevelt, unlike his wife, was, one might say, indifferent to these questions. He wasn't indifferent? Indifferent. He wasn't a racist, um, although he spent a lot of time in the South, but indifferent in the sense that it wasn't high on his priorities to crusade to try to change the racial order. But now, wait a minute. What I get from, what I get yes. from reading <laughs> your book is that he had no option. If he, was to be, if he were to be successful in his New Deal legislation, and then most importantly, later in his war activities, he was going to have to, had no choice, no, that's, but to go along with the South. No, that's quite right. Your, your reading is an accurate reading of the book. Um, he had no choice. But sometimes we find ourselves in circumstances of no choice, and we deeply regret and resent not having had the choice. In the case of President Roosevelt, I don't think he saw it quite that way. Eleanor did, but not Franklin. Why do you say that? Um, the, well, you take no pleasure in saying that. No, I, I take absolutely no pleasure. I think in that, in that manner, I don't even mean it. Of course, it's, it, it, it's retrospectively a critical comment, but it's a critical comment on the much wider milieu of um, American politics and society um, at that moment. I think it was true that the majority, great majority, of northern, uh, non-southern political actors in Congress, in the executive branch, and elsewhere, not all, but almost all, um, took the southern system uh, as if a fact of nature. Um, it's the way it was. Even a Republican president, uh, William Howard Taft, in 1909, in the midst of one of the most boring um, inaugural addresses in American history, uh, spoke in the middle paragraphs that leap off the page when one reads it to explain how it's no longer the business of the federal government to be concerned with Southern race relations. Um, this matter is now settled. And he spoke at just the moment when the Southern states had completed their legal regime that came to be called Jim Crow. And Franklin Roosevelt grew up within that world. Uh, both major parties at the time thought that race was not legitimately on the agenda of the federal government. You know, as someone who grew up then, and I concede that FDR was my hero. Uh, as, and mine. Well, you're a lot younger. I lived through Bilbo. Uh, he was very real to me and yes. to the other racists. Uh, I find it very difficult to uh, really to wrap myself around your description of, of FDR. I think FDR was appalled, as many Southerners were appalled, by the Bilbos, who were the um, rhetorical racists, who spoke of mongrelization, who not only spoke in the most despicable terms about African Americans, but about Jews and other minorities. Uh, they were shameless in their speech. Um, many Southerners, most Southern representatives in Congress, were appalled and ashamed at that level of speech. But as one, the Southern members of Congress, including the most liberal, like one of my heroes, Claude Pepper of Florida, mm -hmm. um, never, not once, spoke against segregation. Indeed, in 1948, when President Truman um, so courageously uh, desegregated the military, uh, Pepper um, uh, spoke to his constituents and said, don't misunderstand, the President of the United States is not in favor of ending segregation in daily life in the South. Um, so this was the normal um, uh, character of speech and um, expectations in American life. And one could really find very, very few uh, political leaders who were sufficiently angered and appalled to lead any kind of um, effort or crusade against it. Tell me, um, uh, it must occur to many people reading Fear Itself, there is some connection that you might draw between FDR and the Southern Democrats and his relations with them, and President Obama mm -hmm. and the Tea Party. 
and present Republicans. Well, analogies are tricky across time. Okay, um, you, fair you, enough. You began by asking about um, a description of whether I think like a political scientist, and now I want to assert I'm thinking like a historian, um, and thinking about differences and similarities, but also the differences. The Tea Party would not exist if not for the most radical change in uh, recent American politics, the shift of the South from Democratic to Republican. But in that shift, there was a movement away from a majority of Southern members of Congress and political leaders being, in some sense, liberals. Liberals in terms of uh, social uh, and economic policy, pro-social security. Southerners voted for the Wagner Act. Senators voted, Southerners voted for the National Industrial Recovery Act, for a stronger and larger federal government, for more taxes and redistribution. The South was dirt poor. Um, they were not conservatives in the same sense that an anti-government Tea Party is, with one big exception. By the 1940s, the Southern members of Congress had figured out that if a national labor movement grew strong, the racial order of the South might collapse. And the moment the Southerners departed from the consensus of the Democratic Party, was the moment they realized that they must act with Republicans to limit the capacities of organized labor. And the, the key moment of that came in 1947 with the passage of the Taft-Hartley Act. Two Republicans writing that act with nearly unanimous Southern Democratic support against the veto, overturning the veto of President Truman. And that's the moment where a kind of Tea Party shift begins to occur. But today, of course, President Obama faces not a circumstance of members of his own party resisting some features of uh, his politics, but the other party in a system of divided government. Whereas with the exception of two years in the 20-year period of Roosevelt and Truman, there were significant Democratic Party majorities. But then, in effect, we had a three-party system. Indeed. Northern Democrats, Southern Democrats, and Republicans. And the outcome in issue after issue, including matters of foreign policy and war and peace, um, often to the good as well as not just to the bad, depended on the decisions taken by the segregationist wing of the Democrats. So for those people who want to read the book, nobody's saying don't do the New Deal. We're saying do the, do the New Deal without the racism. We're saying that's still not reparations. You still got to pay reparations. Why are, this is my thing, right? Why are you white leftists pitting universal programs against you paying for three genocides that you owe to black Americans? Why are they mutually exclusive? Why is it that you can't pay my debt and take care of your people? But at the same time, you keep telling me that MMT is the thing that can save us all, but it just doesn't work for black people. I don't understand this. Help me understand, because I'm just a stupid bitch who, with a culinary degree. So help me understand, because all these <laughs> academics, no, for real, I'm just an ex, I'm just an ex video girl with a fucking culin, with a fucking culinary degree. You know, go fucking make some food. I, you know, I know shit about shit. I just used to read sixty books a year, but you know, that still doesn't make me anybody because I don't have a blue check and I don't have a PhD. So explain it to the dummy. Speak dummy for me to make this make sense. <laughs> How you gonna give me the same shit as everybody else, but my people are poorer than anybody else. So everybody, so we the poorest of the poor, but you gonna give us all the same, but you still not gonna give me enough to be good. Fuck you. Like y'all aren't even giving, y'all ain't even giving us enough to even think about selling out for reparations. That's the gag, right? Like y'all ain't even y'all ain't even brought nothing to the table for this nigga to be like, well, we could use reparations, but like everything you talk about, we still gonna be poor. So we like, well, y'all suffering. Y'all can't feed y'all babies. Y'all shit fucked up. Yeah, sounds about good to us. Come on, welcome to the bottom. <laughs> Go ahead. Anything you know, else? Yeah, like um, it's just the only time we get class collaboration amongst the America's whites is for racist purposes. That's the only time America's whites come together. It's the only thing they care about that much. So like, when it comes to these whole like, 
white people leading the left. Like you can't do it without us. And it's not because it's not because we are like so much more savvy than you politically. It's because when you guys gather together, the only thing you can do is oppress other people. Right. Think about it. Like an Italian guy, a white right. South African guy. What are y'all gonna talk about? What do y'all have? What do y'all have in common? Y'all have nothing. Y'all are not the same people. Y'all are not even genetically similar. No more genetically similar than you would be to me. 